And there's something about this generation that we're really steeped in questioning. It's like the hippie generation taught us how to stick it to the man, and we're trying to, we're like stick it to the man 2.0. You know, we're taking it to the next level. And there's this skepticism about our generation, and part of it's beautiful because we're able to create something new. But there's another part that's not so beautiful. And I, it's real, DJ is like this, this man torn in two because he's part of this generation, and so he, he's full of this skepticism, but he's also a man of action. And so he's always like, ah, oh, do this. No, that's retarded. And, and so it's really on his heart to uh, get up here and talk about skepticism. And so I thought, let's let DJ do that since we're bringing the high schoolers in. And this is kind of where we're at in the book of John. And so why don't you guys encourage DJ, give him a round of applause. I knew we would hear from you guys eventually. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Natalie. Is, I stole some of your water. Thanks for calling me retarded, Nate. That was good. good intro. Just kidding. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Notice I look over there because I know they're going to cheer back at me at least. Just kidding. So, uh, all right. Yeah, as Nate said, I'm just a little bit nervous, so I'll probably be scattered for the whole talk. And So I hope you can still understand me. Um, I guess let's just, you would never know how intimidating you are until you're standing right here looking at all of you. Okay. All right. Well, I read an article the other day, and I thought it was a really good news article, and so I thought I would read it. Um, it's just really interesting. The story is, is really actually incredible, and I thought it was good enough that I should share it with you guys. It's called, in retrospect, I guess we might have Restore, resorted to cannibalism a bit early. Well, I suppose everyone's heard about last week's incident by now. You probably have a pretty low opinion of us survivors. And, all things considered, perhaps we deserve it. Perhaps we panicked and resorted to cannibalism a bit early. But you weren't there. You don't know what it was like. I just want, to hear, I, I just want you to hear our side of the story before you judge us. When the six of us got into the elevator that fateful day, we had no idea what was going to happen. We thought we were just going to take a little ride to the 12th floor to the lobby, just like every other day. Don't you think we knew the elevator was, we, do you think that we knew the elevator was going to get stuck between floors? Do you think we got into the elevator saying, hey, you know, we should eat our good old pal Jeffrey, Jeffrey Weinhardt of Accounts Payable? Of course not. During those first few minutes after the elevator car lurched to a stop somewhere between the 7th and 8th floor, we were civilized human beings. Everyone kept cool. We tried pushing the emergency button. We called for help. We even banged the door a little bit. Nothing worked. Still, we figured no big deal. Someone will notice that the elevator is stuck, and this thing will start back up any second. Morale was generally high. John and Peter actually cracked some jokes, if you can believe that. Maybe it started there, the hysteria. Maybe we should have known, but at some point, the voices went away, and pushing the buttons continued to have no effect, and it started to look a lot less like we were going to have a funny story to tell our kids, and a lot more like they'd never hear from us again. It does something to a person to think of that. You confront your own mortality for the first time. You become savage, brutal, one word enters your mind, survive, survive. I have no idea how long we'd been marooned when we started edging towards Jerry. 20, 30 minutes, time has little meaning when you're in a situation like that. It wasn't a spoken decision either. We just all looked at each other and knew something had to be done. It might have been an animal act, but it had certain logic. Jerry lived alone and had nobody special in his life. No kids, no wife or girlfriend, and his parents have died a long time ago. And most important, he was the biggest. We figured there was enough meat on him to keep us alive for the rest of the rest, alive for days, maybe even weeks. Peter told, Peter held him down as I tore at his forearm with my teeth. Not surprisingly, Jerry resisted. He struggled ferociously and shouted, Hey! What the hell are you doing? Can I say that? It's a direct quote. Promise. 
And he, knew, and he knew exactly what we were doing. We were doing whatever it took to survive. Eventually, we were able to knock Jerry out. And as for what we did next, I'm sure you've read about it all in the newspapers. Maybe it was savage. Maybe it was an, an animal act. But human teeth are pointed and sharp for, in the front for a reason. All right, I'm going to stop there. Can anybody guess where that article was written? The Onion. Anybody read that before? Fantastic. Who, raise your hand if you thought this was pretty funny. Come on, it's okay. Raise your hand if you didn't think it was funny at all. Come on, it's okay. <laughs> I love that. That is going to be a very telling tale of whether you enjoy this talk this after night or not. Uh, <laughs> because I'm going to probably be speaking more generally to a specific crowd. And some of us have more of this disease than others of us. I like to call it skepticism, and I have it running through and through of me. It, it's, it's this idea that I need to question everything. And sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it's a curse. And, and while I have this incredible skepticism, and a lot of you do too, some of you maybe not as much, I don't want to encourage you towards skepticism, okay? But it, it's there. Um, while we have this skepticism, on the other hand, we have what Brennan Manning, I think, explained so well. And I, I just want to read that. It's a preface to his book, Abba's Child. Fantastic book. I would encourage you to read it if this speaks to you at all. This is his word before. On February 8th, 1956, in a little chapel in Loretto, Pennsylvania, I was ambushed by the Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. The road I've traveled these last 38 years has been postmarked by disastrous victories and magnificent defeats, soul-diminishing successes and life-enhancing failures, seasons of fidelity and betrayal, periods of consolation and desolation. Zeal and apathy are not unknown to me. There have been times when I felt the presence of God was more real to me than the chair that I'm sitting on, when the word ricocheted off my broken, like a broken-backed lightning in every corner of my soul, when a storm of desire carried me places I had never visited, and there have been other times, when I identified with the words of Mae West, I used to be Snow White, but I drifted, when the word was as stale as old ice cream and as bland as tame sausage, when the fire in my belly flickered and died, when I mistook dried up enthusiasm for gray-haired wisdom, when I preferred the, the cheap silvers, slivers of glass to the pearl of great price. If any of you relate to these experiences, you might want to browse through this book and pause to reclaim your core identity as Abba's child. And maybe I would just add an addendum. If any of you were riveted by that at all, I would encourage you that this, this talk is for you. You see, we live in a world where, or this is what I think, you know, take it for what it's worth, but we have this deep desire to really know God, the true, honest God of the Bible. We want to see Jesus as real. And then there's another part of this world that we live in, and that's just the, why do we do all this stuff? Why, why do we do the things the way that we do? And it seems like this stuff leads me farther from God than closer. And so we have this balance, this tension that, that we don't know how to reconcile. And I, and I want to try to talk about Jesus washing the disciples' feet and hopefully reconciling the two tonight. So let's pray. I could use it. So could you, if you're honest. Father, um, Jesus, I pray that, that what we're talking about would make sense tonight. God, I don't want to be here just, uh, just blabbering and wasting these precious people's time. Lord, but I do want to communicate um, your heart. And so, Jesus, I, I pray that you would just come and be very real. Lord, to the skeptics of us, to the questions that we have, whether we've allowed ourselves to think of them or not, I just pray that you would speak to us where we are. 
we wouldn't have to set aside or leave all our junk and baggage in the other room, but that we would come here as us and that you would just meet us there just like you did Peter when he didn't want his feet to be washed, just like you did Thomas when he didn't even want to believe you anymore. Father, just meet us where we are. I pray that through this, you would call us to action. Oh, Father, make us a place that is full of action and that is full of doing and not just judging or questioning, Father. We give this to you. Do what you will, Father. Amen. And like I say in the high school, and everybody said, <laughs> let's see, just a couple of you. You guys need to work on your responses over here. All right. So like Nate said, today we're jumping into the second half of this uh, passage that you, some of you guys covered last week, some of you didn't. We need to go back over it. It is so, so key. It's like the words of uh, Martin Luther. Um, he, w- he was speaking over and over, and um, one, of his, one of the people in the little congregation that he had at the time came up to him and said, why do you keep talking about the same gospel every week? We're mature. Look at us. We're ready to move on. You know what he said? He said, until you start acting like it, I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. <laughs> we need to hear the basics, don't we? I mean, is it just me? Yes, it is just me. Okay, a couple of you. Thank you, Austin. You're my hero. <laughs> we need to hear it over and over again. And, and so just as we approach this again, let it just sink in. Starting in John 13, 3 through 12. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Let's just stop there for a little bit. If you had all the power in the world, what would you do with it? I'll tell you what Donald Trump does with all of his power. He bought a $125 million home in Palm Beach, Florida. There it is. Check that baby out. $125 million. Over 80,000 square feet, which I don't know if Paul's facts are correct or or not. They probably are, right, Paul? What do you guys think? Are they correct? (laughs) Oh, get some cheers, man. That's good. Uh, Our building here is a little bit over 100, maybe 110. And so that's, that's everything, including the chapel, everything. Bill Gates' house, that is like his third home that he only does a couple parties a year at, is $125 million, 18 bedrooms, 22 bathrooms, like I said, more than 80,000 square feet. I wonder today, if you had all the power in the world and no accountability, just try to ask yourself this question, what would you do with all of the power? What would you do? What would you do? I probably would be more like Bruce Almighty than um, Jesus here. But here's what Jesus does. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer clothing and wrapped the towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. All right, this is ridiculous. I mean, you guys should be going, oh my gosh, that's crazy, or something like that. I mean, that's like Donald Trump coming in here and saying, hey, DJ, you know that toilet that you just plugged? I want to go clean it. Donald Trump doing that to me. I mean, that's, it's absurd. This was the most disgusting part of the Hebrew's body back then. I mean, it was just the feet. Ooh, gross. They walked everywhere where mules walked and pooped, and they walked in poop, and the servants that had to clean their feet. This was not an exciting task. And Jesus goes and does that. I think this is fantastic. Nate hit on this last week a little bit. But Jesus washed the most disgusting part of their body. And the reason I think he did that is because that represents what he wants to do with us spiritually. You know, I don't know where you come from today, but we've all got junk, don't we? We've all got crap. We've all got stuff, dirt on our feet that we don't want to tell anyone about. You know, I know because Vanessa and I both have that kind of stuff. And I'm never going to tell you here what that stuff is, but we've all got it. And here you have the Jesus of the Bible, the compassionate, loving Jesus that is just saying, come to me with your crap. Come to me with your most disgusting part. Come to me with the stuff that 
you don't tell anyone about because I want to wash it. I want to clean it. All right, I'm getting this from back there, so I'll go on. <laughs> um, I had a friend who, uh, he's a really good buddy of mine in college, and and we had this journey together where we decided to have a small group that was just focused around us getting to know each other. And so what we would do is we would have extended times where we would tell our extended life story. And re- literally the shortest story told, there was four of us, and we met for a period of like four weeks. I would encourage you to do this with your friends. The, the shortest story was three hours and 30 minutes long. And, and one of the biggest rules we said was that there can be nothing untold. And that there can be nothing that you would be ashamed enough that you couldn't tell us, right? We wanted to live out this, this community that Jesus had called us to. And I still remember my buddy telling us through his life, and then he stopped at about age 10, and he said, well, there was something that happened to me that I've never told anybody. And to us, we were kind of like, oh, that's not that bad. He uh, overcome in a moment of youthful passion and not knowing to do with it, he uh, he was at his cousin's house. His cousin was sleeping. She was a girl. And he went and kissed her on the lips while she was sleeping. And he was so embarrassed by that. He had never told anyone. And, and I mean, it just absolutely controlled him, you know? And I just thought, wow, that's, that's such a representative of who we all are. We try to go to church and act all good and clean and put together. And we don't want to, you know, worship too loud or noisy in case somebody would think bad about us, you know. And yet we're all the same, aren't we? We're all the same, just in desperate need of Jesus. This, this one that comes to our most disgusting parts. Anyway... So moving on, uh, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Peter, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. I mean, he's stripping off at this point, you know. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and uh, Jesus answered, a person that has a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And this is the grace that Nate talked about last week. The grace that it doesn't matter if you've, you've been coming to church forever and you're washed and you're clean you still have been walking the last 24 hours and the last 48 hours, right? And, and stuff happens. And, and today, are you coming with that mindset of, oh, Jesus, wash me? I encourage you to. And then it says, when he had finished their feet, washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. And he sat down and he said, do you understand what I have done for you? What do you think they were thinking? Uh, Jesus? Right answer? Uh, they had no idea. I want to skip forward now to a story about Thomas. And a good segue into this is, is telling you about a towel I received. When I went to Taylor, again, this great university that I went to, um, when we graduated, we got this fancy, dancy, pretty, clean towel with big Taylor University logo imprinted in it. And it was really nice. And you know what everybody did with their towel when they got it? Because you know what the towel is supposed to represent, right? Jesus washing their feet, and so we're supposed to wash everybody else's feet. You know what everybody else did with their towel? This is the cynic in me. They like took that towel and they said, oh, my beautiful towel. I'm going to keep this forever. And I'm going to store it in the most important room of my house for all to see, that I have this great towel, right? So they, so they go to the store, and they pick out this great, beautiful case for it, squeaky clean, you know, and they hang it up. Isn't that so appropriate with what we do so much, with so much of these, these relics or these ideas? They're meant for, like, doing stuff, and yet we see it as this, like, oh, this is a great memento, Thomas, called the twin, loved Jesus. 
and, and he was one of his disciples, and his feet were washed by Jesus in this time. And then a couple weeks later, Jesus was killed. And so we pick up this story a couple days after Jesus had been resurrected, but Thomas hadn't seen him. John 20, 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, and listen to this, unless I see his hands, in his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Here you have Thomas, this, this great follower of God, right? I, I think this scripture tells us so much about what it means to be cynical and, and so much about what it means to question. Momento. Wrong, no, wrong order. I believe that Thomas couldn't, he felt like he couldn't believe anymore. You know, I'll bet he wanted to believe in Jesus to come back. Do you guys agree with me? I mean, he was a disciple, right? Like, his whole life was committed to Jesus. It's not like he was just some kind of sideline, you know, bench warmer. Like, he was one of the main guys. You know, it's, everybody always makes fun or, you know, talks bad about doubting Thomas. And, you know, like, I even looked up the word skeptic and hit thesaurus. And still Thomas's name came up in the, like, you know, Microsoft Word thesaurus. It said, doubting Thomas is one of the thesaurus words for skepticism. I thought that was so sad for Thomas. And he must just be so, like, devastated, you know? And, and we give Thomas such a hard time, but think about it from his perspective. He had given everything to follow this Jesus. And it had turned out just like everybody else said it would. And all the naysayers was right, and he was crushed. And I think that tells us a lot about why we're skeptical and, and what true skepticism comes from. I, you know, this may be a part that you don't want to hear, but I think there's a lot of skeptical things, a lot of things in the church that we can be skeptical of. Do you guys agree with me? Maybe not. You know, maybe, maybe I'm the only one, but it's hard to just believe in everything, you know, that the church does. I, I can remember being raised under this very black and white, do this, don't do this mentality. I can remember the song that I learned Revelation, Revelation. Anybody know it? 21 8. Is that right? 21 8. Liars go to hell. Liars go to hell. Burn, burn, burn. Burn, burn, burn. And we would sing that and we'd jump around and we'd. Why? What, what were we thinking? And then we realized that. We can lie and not go to hell right away. And we're like, why were we taught that we would just go to hell? Because I'm here. It's pretty cool, actually. You know, it's, it's not hot. And so we grow up being taught all these things. This is what you've got to do. And I think even maybe a marker of our generation is the desire to see things for honest, for truth. You know, we don't, we don't want to follow something that everybody's done just because they've done it. You know, somebody tells us to read our Bible and we're like, Okay, I mean, I want to read my Bible, but why? Why? What, what difference does it really make? You know, somebody says you have to have a quiet time for an hour every day. Really? What about 53 minutes? You know, like, does it need to be an hour? And the list could go on and on, and I don't want to bore you or anger you <laughs> of my list. You know, but we have this skeptical, questioning heart. Where does it come from? I think it comes from this honest desire to know who God is. We're not trying to fake things. We're not trying to just question to be rebels, right? I mean, maybe we are in peace. But in large part, we just want to see things that are real, that are true. And we want to experience the real Jesus of the Bible. You know, we don't want man-made creation, stuff that's made up. We want to do stuff because that's what the, the pew payers you make us do kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, one of the main reasons that I'm bringing up skepticism, like Nate said, is uh, I'm a great skeptic. And 
I would love to not be, and I've prayed to the Lord many times, Lord, just let me believe. <laughs> just let me be rid of all these thoughts. Let me be rid of all these questions. But they're still there. Questions can't be pushed away, can they? Questions are real, you know? When somebody asks you a question and you just say, oh, it doesn't matter, it's not helping anything. And, and lately, I've been going through this journey of extra cynicism. And, um, you know, I don't want to say anything of this to ruffle feathers or say anything's wrong, but just to be honest with you, because I think that's what we need in the church. We need people who are just going to be honest and talk about what's really going on. Um, there's this rev- revival going on in Florida, and uh, Todd Bentley, who knows about this? Most people, right? There's been a lot of hubbub, a lot of YouTube, a lot of uh, TBN, a lot of, you know, the 300 Club maybe. I don't know, actually. But, you know, a lot of stuff that's been talking about this revival, and, and it's been dubbed as this healing revival. And so, so a friend and I, this was before about really any, any new, anybody knew about it much, friend and I was in Cincinnati. He's one of my best friends. He was actually in that small group of four people that we talked through stuff. We're sitting there uh, clicking on YouTube videos, watching this Todd Bentley guy. And we're watching him on the stage, laughing uncontrollably, uh, uncontrollably till he falls down and he's kicking around in circles, you know? And like, that's Jesus moving, brother. That's Jesus. And, uh, you know, we watched it to see like, you know, there's this little area right in front of the stage that was like, It was the Holy Spirit. And so when he would walk into it, he would go, boom! Man, that's the Holy Spirit, brother! Uh Uh-huh! You know, and it's like this drunken type acting guy. And again, I just say, I would love to know that's God, but I just can't believe that. Is God that type of God? You know, and then, so we've been going through this process of working that out as a church too, and, and Wade here, and Bob had a chance to go down there and experience it. And uh, they came back and shared about it. And so we're here listening about the stories. And the one that got me was, and then there was this lady. They didn't say it like this. Sorry, I'm just giving you a hard time, Wade. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, this lady started holding her her teeth and going, oh, you know. And, uh, And so everybody came around and they started shouting, she's got gold teeth. Oh, amen, you know, and, okay, anyway, I was just thinking, why would God give gold teeth to someone? It doesn't even make sense. How can that be real, right? Okay, that's the skeptic in me, but they're real questions. Now, I want to ask you the question. I've been honest enough to share those things. I can tell some of you are aggravated. That's okay. Is it okay for me to question that? Is it okay for me to wonder, is that God? Is it okay for Thomas to say, man, unless Jesus says, shows me his hands and side, no way. You know, and that was the boat that Thomas was in. Picking it back up, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. This must have been a pretty powerful moment for Thomas. Don't you think? You know, doubting Thomas, he wasn't trying not to believe. He desperately wanted to believe. But he didn't know how to because of the experience he'd been through. I think that a lot of us are in the same place in our questioning. And I want to tell you, if you're a questioner, if you're a skeptic, or, you know, all of us are, it's okay can't help it. What matters the most is what we do with it. And that's what we're getting back to talk about. And I would just add on to my story about um, Lakeland, just for PC, you know, political correctness. 
God has met me and spoke to me so, so much in my skepticism and in my wondering and in my questioning. You know why? I think it's the same reason that that Thomas was spoke to. And it's maybe opposite of what we think. But it's because Jesus desperately wants to speak to us in that. Don't you find it interesting that Jesus came into the room and it says he came in, he did his little dance, check me out. I just came through the door, it's closed. And then he walked over to Thomas and he said, Thomas, my brother, my friend, one who I love. You know, I'm adding that, but... Here, feel my hands, Thomas. You know, here, feel my side. Jesus desperately wants us to experience him. You know, if I was God, I would probably say, well, unless you put a lot of effort in, but that's not the kind of Jesus that we serve. He's a God that pursues us and loves us and will give us all the chances in the world. Um... I believe our generation is desperate for experience. And uh, Nate and I talked a lot about this, and we kind of argued and bantered back and forth. And uh, what I mean by that is I'm not talking about the whooping, hollering experience that we see when we watch TBN. I think people are, are sick of following what they're told about. And we are sick of doing religious duties that don't make any sense. We are desperate for an authentic relationship with God. We're sick of going through the motions, showing up and smiling at church just because we're supposed to. Because we are desperate at the core of us to experience the radical Jesus of the Bible. And so going back and, and stepping back, actually, I don't know if I finished. Yeah, I did, okay. Okay. I don't know if I finished telling you that, you know, my politically correct statement about how Wade's a really good guy and he's not fond of the devil or anything. But I kind of said that, didn't I? You guys are lost. I guess I'm losing you. Um, I think it's something we all have to question through. All right. Back to John 13, where we had this story of the washing of the feet. And we're going to get back to the, the application and the most important part of the scripture. I just want you to keep in mind that Thomas, this Thomas that just experienced Jesus and all of his radicalness, is probably just about now getting what Jesus did back then. You know, because when we have it in this light, this light of Jesus pursues us, and he will do anything to help us believe, then we can understand better the rest of this passage. And so let's go back to John 13. Here we go. John 13, 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. Here it is. And this is the key. This is the gospel. This is the core of what Jesus came to do. Hear it. You should also wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This is it. Skeptics, non-skeptics, this is the heart of who Jesus is. Him washing your feet, but it doesn't stop there. There are a couple things that I want to close with. Um, if you're a cynic like me, hear the gospel of Jesus tonight, the whole gospel. One, he pursues you. If you're here and you've never really believed or taken that step of faith, I applaud you for coming to church and, and for questioning enough to be here tonight. Man, Jesus rewards that. He, re, he rewards your pushing into him and questioning I would say to all of us, um, put your skepticism to the test. If you're a questioner, your tendency is to sit back and watch, to make fun, and to leave it at that. And I would say to you, you guys have the greatest opportunity to do, to be Jesus. But it's never going to happen if we don't try. Could it be that God has given you the questions about him 
and the church. He's given you these questions because he wants you to live a real, honest, life-giving relationship with him that other people will admire and come to know him through. Could it be that the questions in you were put there for a purpose? Should you take those to God? The only way we're going to get there is by doing something. You know, it's like, have you guys ever uh, picked a sport that you've never done before and you bought all the equipment because you were like, I'm going to like that? You know what I'm talking about? And then you buy all the equipment, you're like a couple hundred, a couple thousand dollars under, your wife's a little frustrated at you, husband, whatever, mostly wife, and just, you know, just because husbands are the ones that do it the most, right? <laughs> you buy all this stuff and you get there and you start doing it and you're like, I hate this. <laughs> and so you sell it for half price and you just totally lost a lot of money. How are you going to know if you like something? You got to try it out, right? Uh, this is why I love Jared. He's not here tonight. I wish he was so I could pick on him a little bit. You know, if I face down Jared, soundboard Jared. He's like the master of every sport. He buys everything for every sport. I mean, he's good at tennis and mountain. Anyway, he's good at everything. Um, but I love that about him because he's willing to try it. He's willing to go for things. He gets an idea and he just goes for it. I would encourage us to be Jared today. I would encourage us to be people today that try. When you get a little prompting, even if it's just a little thought, what's the hurt in trying? The other option is that, you know, we'll just kind of sit and live this boring, unexciting life. And I think that's not very exciting. Um, yeah, profound. I think Michelle Kanegi is a great example of this. I know she's not here today, but she just got back from a YWAM DTS to uh, South Africa. Some of you guys knew about it. There was bombings. There was shootings right down her street. I mean, she was just absolutely scared to death, literally. And uh, man, she came back and I had the chance to talk with her a little while. You know, she's 19, 20, something like that. I could just see Jesus radiating out of her. Why? Because she just tried. She just stepped out. She said, okay, I, what, what do I have to lose? You know, we've got to take up the towel the problem with skepticism is that it can only so easily take us out of action. And how can we experience life in the kingdom without trying? I think this scripture is at the heart of the message of Jesus. And there are too, too many of us who don't really know who Jesus is because we're unwilling to put ourselves out on the line. Me included. I'm being really honest. But when the time comes, we don't have the guts to step forward. Tonight, I want to encourage you, take this step, you know, try. There's a ton of ways you can do that. You don't need me to tell you that. The best way is to listen to what God is telling you, just to spend some time. God, what do you want me to do? But I would offer that, you know, while we're in here, the high schoolers, we could totally use more adult volunteers, you know? Couldn't we? You guys are crazy. Can't keep you in. Just kidding. <laughs> but we could use people who would be willing to maybe sacrifice their beloved door time, because it's good, to maybe spend some time investing and helping people who don't know God, young people, helping them mature into a life-giving relationship with him. Um, there's a video that we want you to watch, and it's about an opportunity that some of the people here in this congregation have taken, and it's an opportunity where God is just doing incredible things. Um, so I'm going to let you guys watch this video, and as you're watching it, just open yourself to God. Say, God, what do you want me to do? Japan has the world's 10th largest population with approximately 128 million people. The Greater Tokyo area is the largest metropolitan area in the world with around 30 million people. 
Japan is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. In practice, 85 to 96 percent of the population consists of Buddhists or Shintoists. But in reality, only 30 percent of the people say that they actually belong to a religion. Japanese are lovely people, but most of them have no idea that God loves them or that He even exists. With one of the highest suicide rates in the world, most of the Japanese have never met a Christian or have even heard God's amazing promises. And how will they know without someone to tell them? Less than 0.4% of the population are true Christians. In fact, Japan is considered one of the largest unreached people groups in the world. Paz Japan Mission is a branch of Project Amazon Mission. It is an interdenominational church planting mission founded by Tim Huber, who followed his calling to Japan in 1988. This ministry has now grown into three church plants, three gospel choirs, an exciting children's ministry, family classes for mothers, a celebrate recovery program, worship teams, one-on-one -on -one discipleship, and numerous Bible studies. They are now in the process of planting a new church in the Shanondai area that would strictly target youth. Their new vision for this new church is to reach hundreds of Japanese youth using contemporary methods, youth worship bands, outdoor activities, small groups focused on biblical teachings. They want to provide for the youth a place that would make them feel safe and valued. And therefore, they are praying for God's provision to meet the following need. They really need missionaries who are passionately in love with Jesus and who have a zeal for reaching the lost with His gospel. They also need people who have some experience working with youth and who have a heart for the Japanese. They're in need of worship leaders or even just band members. They're asking for people that, that would cover their ministry in prayer. And also, those who feel led by God to contribute financially to support these new missionaries who are going to respond tonight. Their desire is to see many Japanese youth come to know the Lord and be discipled and trained as leaders to reach their generation for Christ. Their long-term vision is to see the birth of new churches all over Japan and the youth of a nation proclaiming Christ. As we close here, we're going to sing a song like we usually do. And I don't know what you guys are used to, but uh, I would just like to let the presence of God um, move us a little bit. And um, not everyone, but I know that some people in here are kind of feeling and experiencing that um, what we talked about tonight was for you. And um, you know, the Bible speaks very strongly about the laying on of hands that it passes something on to us. And so during this last song, what I want to do is uh, I want people who want more out of their actions to just stand up right now. And then we're just going to have some people gather around you and pray for you. Really simple. Really simple. But we want to ask that we would leave here unchanged so that we don't just go to church, be happy, go home, come back to church, be happy, but that we would be people who are just sharing his love to everyone. If there's someone around you that's, that's standing, just put a hand on them and pray for them during this last song. And may the God of the harvest raise up workers, workers to go throughout Grand Junction and this nation and this world to just change stuff bring his, his kingdom.
All right. Now you guys see why we had DJ come up and give that talk. Because he had a word, didn't he? I know it's like that Holy Spirit thing, DJ, where you walk through and it hits you that you're talking about Todd Bentley. It's over there right now. Because this entire half of the room stood up. If you guys didn't get prayer, because like a whole bunch of you stood up, and that is totally awesome. It's awesome to see when God moves like that. If someone didn't get prayer, um, I'm going to hang out over here. I'm going to have some of my friends, you know who you are, small group, you know who you are. Just hang out over here with me. And if you, if you need prayer, come over here. The other thing DJ hit on, and he showed the video, is that, man, some of you are just looking to pull the trigger. You're looking to act. You're looking to go somewhere. Well, um, Christine Huber, who is who's the wife of the guy who started the whole Japanese thing, is here tonight with us. And if you're interested in talking with her, they're looking for short-term missionaries, long-term missionaries. They're looking for whatever they can get. So if that interests you at all, she's going to be out next to the marriage ministry out in the lobby. And she's got kind of their vision, a little packet of their vision. And she'll take your email and you can keep in touch with her. And you can meet up with, we've had two young adults from this ministry already go over there and do like a year-long program. So she's going to be out there. But yeah, those were the two things I wanted to hit on. If you need prayer, don't want you to forget. Here, and if you want to pull the trigger, you want to do it, you can go talk out there. Other than that, let's just thank God for his word, and let's, let's be on our way. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you. It all began at the cross began where you came down in the image of sinful man and you got disgusting on the cross and you did it for us but you didn't so that you didn't do it so that we would just sit complacently God but you called us you called us to do something to step out for you I don't, I don't get that concept God it's, it's beyond me it's bigger than me but the little bit I've grasped I just thank you for I thank you that all of us can join in your ministry, God. So bless us. Bless these people here tonight, that your beloved church, my family, Father, and call them. Thank you for your word, and thank you for what you spoke through DJ tonight. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll see you guys next week.